Okay, it says preparing to live stream the meeting, but last time that's when it started. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I've got meeting is now streaming live. Yeah, it's happening. Yeah. It's happening. Okay. Um, <laughs> hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today, I'm joined by H. Lyle, author of Murder the March Hare, and some of the authors of Folklore, a dark anthology, uh, which is coming out uh, today. Uh, we've been doing live streams for the past three days. Um, so if you haven't already oh it's opened it's opened in the background <laughs> um uh we've been doing live streams for the past few days so if you haven't already and you want to hear more about the stories we're talking about tonight you can go and watch them uh we actually have a whole double release playlist it's the first thing you'll see on our U youtube channel page and it has uh all the of this week's live streams as well as trailers and ask our authors videos related to these fa two fantastic books. Uh, before we start, if you're new to our channel, we're an indie press dedicated to bringing the world the very best in new adult, young adult and children's fiction. We post our book trailers and wisdom from our authors here on our YouTube channel every Friday. So if you're new here, you like what you see and you want to learn how to improve as an author, consider subscribing. During the last two live streams, I announced two audiobook competitions, so be sure to check them out if you haven't already. Tonight, at the end of this short, at the end of this live stream, I'm going to be announcing the less, the next Crystal Peak short story competition. So stay tuned. Uh, so to start, uh, why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Who, who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> So I'll go first. Okay, let's be brave. Okay, so I'm Katie Brignall. I uh, retold the story of the Modi Do in the folklore anthology. Um, oh, I don't know what else to say, really. I um, work in a primary school. Um, I've been off for a, a while, but that's that is my day job. Um, but I've been enjoying doing a lot more writing recently. So that's me. Uh, I'll go next. Um, I'm Natalie or NJ McKay. I wrote the uh, Crimson Sails short story, which is uh, based off of the Little Mermaid myth, our story from Hans Christian Andersen. And uh, yeah, I'm actually uh, trying to be a full-time writer right now. <laughs> uh, I'm Alice. I wrote Seal Skin, uh, which was the one about Selkies. Um, yeah. I'm Virginie. Um, I'm half French and half Thai, and I decided to retell um, actually a, a Thai myth that in itself is a retelling of an Indian myth, um, the Ramayana, from the point of view of the, the villain's daughter. So it's called the Mermaid of Longka. And I normally work in, in training in retail. Um, my name's Elizabeth. Uh, I wrote the story Gifts and Curses, which is a retelling of Snow White and Rose Red. Um, my day job is uh, counseling. I'm a mental health therapist and this is my first piece that's been published, hopefully of more. And I'm Heather or H. Lyle and I wrote Murder the March Hare, which is a murder mystery for young adults. And I work in healthcare and I'm a student nurse as well. <laughs> okay, so, um... Elizabeth's the only one who hasn't been able to join us for our previous live stream. So first I'll ask uh, her some questions and then everyone else can ask each other questions. So um, I'm going to start with some questions that are from the two contributors to our other book. Uh, no, to this book that's coming out tomorrow. I haven't probably written the script. <laughs> to, the, <laughs> to this book that's coming out today, Folklore Dark Anthology, who weren't able to join us for any of the live streams. First few are from Ashley Craig, author of a fantastic retelling of Rumpelstiltskin written from his perspective. If you're watching this later and you want to hear her talk about her story, I'll put her recommendation, her contributions to our Ask Our Author series in the cards in the top right hand corner. The first one is, when it comes to your writing process, are you a pantser or a plotter? Um, if I want to actually finish something, I have to be a plotter. Um, I try to do at least a loose outline before I start something, but I also like to leave a lot of room in there to play around and kind of see what happens in with, within that structure. So I don't wanna, I don't know, I don't wanna over plan, but I've learned that if I wanna actually meet a goal, then I have to plan somewhat. So 
I'm going for a blend of the two. Okay. Uh, which usually comes first for you, the plot or the characters? Um, the characters always come first. And then the plot tends to kind of evolve from that as I think about the characters more in my mind to get to know them better. Um, the things that they would do and how they would drive the plot that kind of evolves from knowing the characters. What's a typical writing day for you? Oh, wow. Um, what's a typical day for <laughs> anything <laughs> anymore, I guess? Um, I don't know. I always have good intentions to write on a daily basis. It rarely happens. Um, I got to find time in between work and things like that. So I definitely don't do as much regular writing as I would like, but usually, I don't know, when I was really working hard and have keeping to a schedule, I would try to write at least a few days a week for a couple hours and get something done. How many works in progress do you have ongoing right now? Oh, wow. Um, I've, the main one I'm thinking of, I'm working on a sci-fi novel. Um, I also have more of a high fantasy type novel that I was working on for a while. I've kind of put that to the back burner at this point. Um, I've always got some kind of short story in the works, but everything's kind of, everything I've got going is in progress at this point, so. Um, what's the key theme in your story? Um, the key theme of Gifts and Curses, I would say, is it's definitely a family story, uh, specifically a story about sisterhood and those kind of nuances of female friendships and relationships. Um, it's a coming of age story as well, I would say. And then with this one, I also leaned into the romance angle a little bit more than the original does. Mm. So I would say that's a pretty strong element as well. What book are you currently reading? Um, the, the one I can think of, I haven't been able to do as much reading as I would like either. Um, for work, I've been reading a book called The Whole Brain Child, because uh, I work with kids quite a bit. And that really is the most recent book I can think of that I've read, but I haven't gotten to read much fiction in quite a while, or haven't made time for it in a while, I guess. What do you like to do when you aren't writing? Uh, I'm a musician. I like to sing. Um, I play a couple instruments uh, with varying levels of skill, I guess, but I enjoy it. Um, Recently, I'm getting back into running again. I used to really enjoy that and had stopped for a while. So I'm trying to make that more a part of my life. Um, any opportunity that I can go out and be in nature, anything like that. Thinking back to when you were a kid, what's the first thing you remember wanting to be when you grew up? Um, a vet, a vet for sure. I was in animal lover as a kid. I still am. Um, that was my, that was my first dream job. That didn't pan out. <laughs> okay, so thanks for Ashley for those questions. And uh, these questions are from Joseph Chaplin, the author of Fairies from Folklore, a dark anthology. If you want to hear how he turned an old poem from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory into a short story, I'll put his contributions to our Ask Our Author series in the cards in the top right, right after the stream. What are some tips about how you go about publishing your work? Um, well, like I said before, and I think I've heard other people say this, um, this is my first experience with being published at all. Um, and I guess the way I went about this was to just be on the lookout for opportunities, um, be open to things that might come along, especially things that are unexpected, because you never know what's going to pan out and what's not. Um, I guess another tip that's been helpful for me is to try to connect with other writers as much as possible and do mm. some networking that way, whether it's through 
the social media or however, but it's good to, it's good to kind of know other people that are interested in the same things that you are, because they may have advice and they may have uh, opportunities that they know of that you don't. And so that could be a good avenue also. How important is it to have an online presence? Uh, it's pretty important from, <laughs> from what I've heard and uh, from what I've experienced. Um, my online presence, I would say like, it's not necessarily where I would like it to be, but it's getting there. Um, I think the most, Im- one of the most important things about having a social media presence is, again, it's an opportunity to connect with people, whether it's other writers who you have a lot in common with, or whether it's potential readers that are interested in what you're working on. Um, Social media is a good way to kind of show your personality to people and show them who you are. So I do think it's important. I'm enjoying Instagram. That's really the main (laughs) social media uh, that I do right now. Okay. Um, How many times do you redraft slash rewrite something before it's ready? Wow. Um, I guess it depends. I don't finish a lot of stuff. (laughs) So um, that kind of factors into it. But with this story, I think I remember going through probably two or three times and reading through the whole thing. And I had to cut a lot. So there was a couple of rounds of uh, taking things out that in order to meet the, the word limit. So that was my big thing. And even looking back on it now, like, I don't know if any of y'all experienced this, but I look at things I've written and there's always something I think I could change that. Like, is it ever really ready? Is it ever really done? Um, but at a certain point, you've just got to put it down and, <laughs> and let it be what it is. Who are some of your favorite authors? I love Garth Nix. Um, everything I've read that he's written, I absolutely love. Um, and Juliet Marillier is another one of my favorites. She has a style to her writing that I'd like to emulate. I think it influences me a lot. Those are the, the two that come to mind for sure. Okay. Um, what are some of your favorite books and why? Hmm. Um, favorite books. That's so difficult. I love, uh, I love Lord of the Rings. I think I've heard that mentioned just because it's such a, a, such a cornerstone of any fantasy fans, uh, reading list, I guess. Um, you've got, you've got to know a little bit of Tolkien, I think, if you want to, uh, write fantasy. Um, I love the Abhorsen series by Garth Nix, who I mentioned earlier, just because I related so much to, uh, the main characters. He writes a, a heroine really well. Um, and that's, uh, those are stories that I really remember rereading and over and over again as a adolescent, like as a young adult reading books. And so those are the ones that come to mind for me. Okay, so those are all the questions from uh, Joseph. Thank you very much for those, Joe. Uh, and now here are some questions from Kevin, the publisher and managing director of Crystal Peak Publisher. Has having your work published changed your writing process? Uh, I don't know if it's changed my process necessarily, but it's changed the way I think about looking for ways to get my work out. Um, It's made me more aware of contests like this one, and it's kind of shown me how to seek out things like that. And if there's prompts that I connect with, it's just kind of made me more aware of that whole avenue because this was something I sort of stumbled upon accidentally. And now I can kind of seek out more things like this now that I know they're there. That's probably been the biggest change. As a writer, what would you choose as your mascot slash avatar slash spirit animal? Um, I love this question. This took me a while <laughs> to <laughs> come up with the, what I would pick. Um, but I think probably a turtle or something that just kind of moves at a steady pace, but keeps on persevering. I mean, you get to the finish line eventually. 
that's kind of, <laughs> that's where I'm at right now in my process. So just kind of plugging along. Uh, has the lockdown or current situation in the world changed the way you write? Um, I don't think it's changed necessarily the subject matter that I like to write about. Um, just the added stress and anxiety of it all has changed my writing habits a lot. Um, it's made it a lot harder for me to feel motivated, I guess, to keep up the pace that I was keeping up before. Um, so even though theoretically I should have more time, it hasn't really panned out that way in terms of being more productive as a writer, just because there's a, a lot to think about and my priorities are kind of different. There's been personal things going on with the lockdown and that whole situation. So it has, I'd say it has changed it the way that I write. How many hours a day do you write? Um, I don't write every day. I would like to, but I don't. Um, on a good day, I'll get, on a good day, I think I'll get two or three hours in, but that's a good day. How many books are waiting on your to be read pile? Oh man. Um, <laughs> any book I come across, it seems like is waiting for me right now. Um, <laughs> I'm not even sure, like I couldn't name ones that I have on like a list to be read, but I, it seems like I'm always coming across summaries of books and I'm like, oh, I'd love to read that. And it's just, the time has not been there for me at this point, but there's always something I'm coming across that just sounds like it'd be up my alley and I'm not getting around to reading it yet. Okay, so a big thank you to Kevin, Joseph and Ashley for those fantastic questions. Now we'll go on to uh, my more specific ones. Uh, what was it about the original tale that stood out to you? Um, the first experience I had reading Snow White and Rose Red, uh, it was in a book of like adaptations of fairy tales specifically for kids, like for a younger age group. Mm. And it stuck with me uh, like as a little kid, I think, for a lot of different reasons that have stayed with me as an adult. Mainly, I think, um, just the name recognition of Snow White, like you think of a completely different story. And I was like, oh, this is not the Snow White that I know. That's kind of cool. Um, and then also the idea that there are two sisters that are at the center of it. That was new for me because I'm used to like, there's one there's one girl in the story like there's one female character mm -hmm. and this one I enjoyed the fact that the dynamic between the sisters was just so good they always supported each other um they worked together towards a common goal it just was a really nice dynamic between them and so that kind of that gave me a fondness for that story that just stayed with me do you think that this story tends to be overlooked because one of its characters is called Snow White? Yeah, I really do. Um, just because the the other Snow White has been so adapted, uh, like the Disney adaptation and the Snow White and the, the Huntsman or whatever, there's been a lot of really high profile adaptations of that other story. Mm -hmm. And this Snow White um, that has the sister Rose Red is a totally different character but I think just like I said before that name recognition of Snow White you automatically think something else you don't think of that in association with this particular story so it's, it was cool to uh bring that bring that story out a little bit because I do think it gets overlooked uh, why did you decide to in to uh, add the witchcraft elements to the story um I was kind of, I was reading through the original and there was a lot of stuff I was planning to change. And I was thinking about the premise of this family that lived uh, alone in the woods. There was really nobody around. It was just sort of them on their own. And I was looking for a backstory as to why that might be, uh, why they'd be isolated in that manner. And 
just kind of thinking about the feel of Grimm's fairy tales and just folklore of that kind of tradition, there was this stigma against magic uh, that I thought, well, maybe that might be a cool element to add just because I like to add an element of magic anyway when I'm writing. And I thought it could be an interesting way to explain, well, you know, why, why are they isolated out there? Maybe there was a more sinister reason for it. Maybe um, they were not always so isolated. And that kind of was where the inspiration for it came from. And then I also ended up using it as a way to make a distinction between the two sisters, uh, Snow White and Rose Red, beyond just one has blonde hair, one has brown hair. And that, like, that was it in the original. And so I thought, well, what if one sister has this ability and one does not? Like, how does that change their dynamic? And that, it was just a fun way to kind of get into uh, characterizing them a little bit more. Did you research witchcraft at all in preparation for the story? Um, really only as it's portrayed in fiction, I guess. Hmm. Um, there's this idea, I, I don't know, in the fantasy stories that I've read that involve magic, it seems to be, there's this, there's one camp where magic is this innate ability that you have and you're born with. And in other stories, magic is a skill that you can hone through practice. And I was kind of looking at both of those concepts and maybe trying to find a blend of the two and kind of play around with those ideas. And I know there's a whole world of like modern Wicca and those practices that I really didn't dive into when I researched this. I, um, my main form of research was how is magic and witchcraft portrayed in fiction and stories of this type? Um, apart from the uh, uh, the witchcraft, how much did you change in the story and why? Um, I changed a lot, I think. It, it feels like I changed a lot. Um, I aged up the, the two girls. Um, they were children in the original. And I wanted a chance to mature their relationship and have them going through some of the young adult insecurities and issues that kind of make it a coming of age tale. And if they're, oh, cause they're in their early twenties, I think they're 20 years old in, in my spin on it. And it just kind of allowed me to deepen their relationship a little bit, but still keep that same, uh, that same bond. They're by each other's side, no matter what. Um, another thing I changed was the character of the mother. I expanded her a lot, um, made her kind of a more sinister character. You don't really know what her motives are and what she's, what she's, what her like machinations are in the background. You get a sense that that's going on, but you're not really sure what she's up to. Um, that was a, just sort of a vibe that I wanted to add to it. So I thought she'd be a good vehicle for that. Um, and the bear, at the end of the, in the original tale, the end of the story, the bear becomes a prince, as you know, is a tradition of Grimm's fairy tales and that kind of story from, and in this one, I didn't want to wait till the end for that to happen. So I kind of made him a, a hybrid type shapeshifter. So we got a human side of the bear before the end to get to know him a little better okay so um that's all of my questions for elizabeth uh do any of you guys have any questions for her so it's okay if you don't um, i mean you know yeah that's fine <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure like that your, your questions generally are, are more broad for everybody but yeah i think i've got more questions for for kind of the group <laughs> Same. <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> oh, uh, does anyone have any questions specifically for Heather? Maybe about like writing a full length book or? Yeah. How, how long did it take you to write the, the full novel? Uh, in total, a good five years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. 
but that's because I took it out, wrote it, put it away for six months, brought it out. I just couldn't put it away and leave it there. It just sort of kept reappearing on my screen and played with it and put it away and then brought it back. I think if I did it straight out, start to finish without the breaks, it probably would have been about two years. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, a long time, <laughs> very long time. But Not long compared to some novels though, in all fairness. I've, I've heard of some taking much longer than that. So well done, that's really fantastic. Did you have to do many drafts or rewrites? Um, a few, I, I do three long drafts, start to finish in different formats, in different places. But I, as I edit, as I go along, it isn't huge things I tend to do. I, I mean, I may have wrote the first two chapters about 50 times before I stopped touching them and left them alone. <laughs> but yeah, it was back and forth, constantly back and forth. Never really stopped playing around with it. What made you decide it was actually finally ready to try and publish? Um, I was having a moment where I'd worked on it for a fairly long time. I would rewrote one of the, the ending parts and I was like, what else can I do to this? And it was a period of time I was like, are you still doing that novel? Like, leave it alone, try something else. And I had other ideas happening and I was like, I'm never going to get to the others if I am still in 10 years probably writing the same story. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just thought yeah. I'd get, send it off let it to the world and see what happens but yeah it was impatience to write something else I think. Did you let any friends or family read it before you sent it off? Um, my best friend who who's practically family um, he was the first to read and uh, my sister Frances my middle sister yeah she read it through just for a confidence boost like mm -hmm. sending things out to agents and stuff is scary as hell and I just kind of wanted someone to go, yeah, no, it's fine. It's a novel. Send it out, see what happens. Um, and she was the one who gave me that shove. So I owe her a lot. I have some uh, annoying questions for all of you, though. <laughs> I couldn't ask myself questions on my own one. So I'm saying, <laughs> yeah. I hope you're OK, but they're, they're not quite so serious. <laughs> Are we OK to start? Can I? Yeah, just... sure. Um, so one of the favourite things I do with my best friend is do the hypothetical. If this was turned into TV or shown on live stream or something like that, who would you want to play your lead character in your story? Or am I the only one who just thinks like that? No, if I 100% do that. <laughs> you could have I think about it, but I never come up with an answer. Yeah. Or at least what you'd want from them, what kind of attributes or... Sorry. Not the kind of question you're probably expecting, but um, <laughs> well, I, I don't really have a main character in mind, to be honest. So, yeah, I think that'd be hard to say, really, because like my my main character is the Modi do itself. So, <laughs> I, th I could think of a maybe an actor I, I don't like very much and make them dress up as a big kind of <laughs> actual dog or but... any famous <laughs> characters, hmm. someone who would hate <laughs> being covered up. Yeah, food for thought, that. <laughs> I think I find it easier to fan cast other people's books than my own, because I don't know if anyone else gets this, but I know we're actually, I was watching another author Q&A where they said the same thing, like, I can never actually see the character's face. It's like, I kind of know what they should look like, enough to describe them, but like not specific enough. Um, I did think about this, though, because I do draw, but there's no one famous and my, I went, basically, I went on Instagram, searched Thai male model <laughs> to try and figure out <laughs> what, like, Hanuman would look like. And I found one who was like, yeah, you look cheeky enough. Like, you, you would do. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how I've gone about it. I quite like the idea of using someone not famous. Yeah, like, I'm more, like, I always imagine my stories in more animated tone anyway. Like, I'm a big fan of anime in Japanese animation so I always go in that route and yeah I, I don't like again with all the voice actors and the talent behind that I really doesn't matter at that point but I uh I don't tend to look think of actors or actresses playing my characters again it's the same idea with Virginia like I just can't picture anybody right up again I'm not even in 
knowing who's the big stars right now anyway to figure out who would work or not. <laughs> if you like animation, have you ever thought like who, who, like a particular <laughs> anime style that you're like, yes, I love, <laughs> if you love Studio Ghibli, you're like, I want Studio Ghibli to do it or well, yeah. I yeah, really Studio Ghibli's like, on my list for sure. They do amazing stuff. Um, uh, it's so hard because like I, I know some styles, like, but again, everybody's under big groups right now. So it's hard to like pinpoint who's the actual, like who would do it. So I, 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 I can't, there's too many. Like there's so many different styles and I watch so many different types of anime that it's so hard to pinpoint down. Um, I have a question for everyone and it would be what, what do you find hardest in writing? self-doubt probably I'm constantly looking back at what I've written going no that's that's awful no that's no good do it again do it again I think that's that's probably a bit of a cliched answer really isn't it but no I think it's the actual believing that what I want to say is actually worth saying is quite hard because it I just think it makes everything take even longer you're just constantly second guessing yourself aren't you and yeah yeah that's probably it for me <laughs> I guess this is just writer's block, but sometimes you know what you want to write next, you know exactly how it's going to play out, but you just can't write it for some reason, and it just won't come. <laughs> I think for me, it's mainly the after the writing, it's not really the actual writing bit, it's having to edit, I'm, I hate editing. <laughs> I can't, I, I go word blind, so I'll see, I miss the silliest little mistakes constantly and it, it'll take another pair of eyes to look at it and go did you just write the same word three times in a row like did you miss that um for me to go okay I'll change that but yeah it's definitely the editing and definitely that whole submission part and working up to leaving the manuscript alone and sending it off I think that's harder than actually putting together the story for me Yeah, editing is definitely my weak point. Um, I struggle with tensing. Like I change my tenses sometimes and yeah. my grammar is not always the best. So the, it's just like forcing myself to go through and try to find what I can find and then hoping that the people that I give it to to critique or friends that I hope they can help me find the other spots where I've slipped up. But yeah, that's, it's just trying to, polished the manuscript to that point where it's ready to go off which is the hardest part for me i find myself with a lot of extra stuff in there that doesn't actually work within the, <laughs> the plot but um and i struggle with knowing like what to cut or what i uh with cutting things that i don't want to cut but i know like you know this is messing up the flow it needs to go but I just get really attached to things like that and that's kind of tough to make those calls yeah I get really attached and it's always like the the bits that you you were really proud of when you wrote them and you're like you know that's yeah. not actually very good that needs to go <laughs> I'm gonna get to know the characters a bit but then at the the finished product it doesn't need it and that's kind of to me that's kind of sad I, I just want it all to be in there I always have like a, a, a another folder where I save it. I was like, I'll come back to you one day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I find dialogue really hard. I think especially because I write a lot of, not a lot of first person, but for me, like the internal like world of the character is so strong. I for, I don't know then like how how do they speak to normal people? <laughs> it's like I know how they speak to themselves, but I don't know how they speak to others. Not something I struggle with. <laughs> I think dialogue's my weakest technical point with writing actually I just I just I really struggle with it sounding forced sometimes and you think no that's that's not how people speak in conversation so you have to go back and go no just that needs changing completely yeah, yeah. um oh I have a question that I asked the other night and it'd be interesting to hear your answers. Um, where would your ideal writing location be? Hmm. 
I'm like, I what? See your what? brains going. Yeah. <laughs> Picturing all these lovely places. Yeah. <laughs> Probably somewhere quiet, but where you can also get like drinks and snacks without breaking your flow too much. Um, I had gone to um, not really a conference, but like a workshop, and one of the authors there had like a uh, she formatted a um, shed for her writing, and kind of like it's away from the house. And I don't, I think she cuts. I don't know if she cuts off all the internet, but she cuts. I think she has like you no know, stops the internet at that point too and it's just like a desk and her laptop and some power and the heater but and I'm like that would actually work I would think that uh -huh. whole like separating yourself out completely try to like close yourself off from distraction mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. to allow you just to focus on writing itself like that might work for me <laughs> I do find that it's a lot easier to not get distracted if you don't have internet <laughs> yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> I think I'm, I was thinking of like, there are a lot of places that I would love to in theory. Like I love the idea of like going out into nature and writing, but when I'm in my flow, I'm usually typing on a laptop and I hate the glare <laughs> on a laptop. Yeah. So it's like, I always have this like perfect image of like, oh, I'll just go into the garden and write. <laughs> oh, this, this doesn't work actually. You just need to be at like at home or inside somewhere, ideally with, with drinks or snacks. <laughs> <laughs> close by and and my reference books as well because I tend to write I usually write a lot of historical inspired fiction so it's I I can't have the internet completely off or if the internet's off then I need some some of my reference books nearby so I kind of can jog my memory about specific things uh, for me I, I mean I stalk Neil Gaiman on Instagram um <laughs> I like Neil Gaiman <laughs> Yeah, he took a photo. He normally writes in this cabin in the woods anyway. But when he moved to New Zealand, there was like this cave and it was just beautiful. And I mean, I probably wouldn't get any work done because I'd sit there and just enjoy being there. But it was like <laughs> candle lit and it was warm. There was a heater. It was on his own. There was no people for miles. Yeah, it sounds perfect. Probably wouldn't get a lot done. But yeah, if I could have anything, either his cabin or his cave. Yeah, they both sound amazing to me. It'd definitely be a cabin in the woods for me. <laughs> yeah, Roald Dahl had a shed in his garden, didn't he, that he used to write in? Oh. It was like a shed with a giant chair, and he used to tell his grandchildren that there were wolves in the hut so that he didn't disturb him. <laughs> sounds like something to his grandchildren. <laughs> yeah. He also taught his grandchildren to drive. Oh. And then when... Um, uh, one of them broke down on the way to the shops. He was angry, not because she stole the car, but because he didn't teach her how to restart the car when it stalled. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm going back to Neil Gaiman. I heard a, a great quote from him the other day. I think it was one of those um, uh, those masterclass adverts oh, yeah. saying um, uh, the the key to the, doing the second draft is you have to act, make it look as if you knew what you were doing all along. <laughs> I listened to a podcast that it sounds really stupid, but blew my mind where the guy was talking about how he, how he does foreshadowing for things. He was like, you know, you can add the foreshadowing afterwards. So you make the thing happen and then you, you <laughs> add in hints all along to make it look like, you. and I was like, wow, that's so, that seems really obvious now that you said it. I would literally just thought authors were the smartest <laughs> people to foreshadow so cleverly. <laughs> So going back to what you said, Virginie, about uh, needing your laptop and typing on your laptop. So do you guys just write straight onto a laptop or do you use notepad and pen? I mean, I'm quite old fashioned and I have to write my first draft in ink or pencil on paper and then I, I, I type it up and edit it as I type it up. So how about the rest of you? I need paper and pen for brainstorming and, and like like the kind of plotting or thinking out thoughts or like, you know, what's important to this character, any kind of things where I'm generating ideas, I need pen and paper. But if I'm like writing, then it's faster. I, I touch type, so it's much faster for me to type directly than to write it out and then type again. If I don't wanna be tempted to edit as I go, then I really like pen and paper for that. Um, just because if I'm on my laptop, I like every paragraph, I want to go back and edit it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and 
So then I have like one paragraph done at the end of my writing time. So if I just want to like get something out and not think about going back and polishing it right then and there, then I like to use pen and paper. But typically I just am on the laptop. Uh, I definitely more streamlined onto the laptop, but I found that especially after the first draft, I like to make my notes after the first draft for the second draft on pen and paper, like next to me as I'm reading it. Like I find that there's still something with the pen and paper that helps me organize my thoughts. But again, like it's usually in that in between I'm preparing to go into the next draft. I kind of write my notes out first so that I have something else or before I go back into like a second draft or third draft. I do all my planning on post-it notes and random bits of paper, um, character planning as well, and pen and paper, but everything for me goes straight onto the tablet. Um, I have dodgy hands, so writing by hand isn't, doesn't work for me. So yeah, straight to type. It's easy to delete and I do a lot of deleting. So that works best. I'm just purely computer. Like I did try like writing notes with a notebook, but then I just lost the notebook. <laughs> so, yeah, just all on the computer. Space. Yeah, I have random notes scattered through so many different notebooks. It's a known thing that I'm, I'm a bit of a stationary addict. So like, <laughs> Christmases, birthdays, gifts from children at school, they always get me notepads and I've just got so <laughs> many. But they're also lovely and I, I don't want to use them. So... <laughs> I make little notes in all of them. They're scattered all around the house. I feel like I need to make some sort of directory or spreadsheet of all the different notebooks I have and what, <laughs> what notes for what project are in which. I think I, the danger of very beautiful stationery is that I, the ones that are just too beautiful, you're like, ooh, I must save this for my most precious thoughts. And so you never write anything in them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've, just like I've got me. some of them. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got like two little leather ones. And yeah, I haven't touched them. <laughs> I'm too scared to touch them. That's so nice. Yeah, no, I've, I've got some lovely ones and it drives my husband up the wall. He's like, what's the point in having them if you're not going to write in them? Then I've, I've got one really lovely personalised one from a, a childhood I, I did a lot of work with at school and it's got my name on it. And I just, I, oh. it's so lovely. I can't bring myself to write in it. <laughs> so it's just sitting there, pristine. And it says how lovely I am on the front, so that's a reminder. <laughs> Sometimes when I don't feel very good. I force myself now with all the nice notebooks I have. It's like, great, you're writing in this. It's fine if it's trash. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be sad if you don't use it for its purpose. I have that a question for everyone. Um, you know I like ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask you guys what kind of were your earliest memories of ghost stories or was there any particular ghost story that used to scare you a lot as a kid? Um, there wasn't a lot of ghost stories going on, but I, I am big into ghosts as well. But I think when I was a kid, my friend told me a ghost story that happened to her dad and it had to do with something with footsteps in the attic when they were kids. And it really terrified me. <laughs> That was probably close to my first experience of a ghost story being told to me, so. I just remember reading uh, Goosebumps. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I remember what any of the stories were, but I read so many of them. I read so many of them as well. Just And then there was Fear Street, yeah. which was like the kind of the other R.L. Yeah. sign. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> I never read Goosebumps because the covers terrified me so much. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I was too scared to read Goosebumps. No, my daughter's got several of them. She likes them. I don't remember reading them when I was a kid, but yeah, she loves them. I remember we, um, me and my friends growing up, we used to always tell each other scary stories, and but you used to have to make a thing out of it. And you used, you used to have to like lie the person down and make them close their eyes and then it'd be all dramatic, <laughs> terrified, absolutely terrified. So yeah, there, there was several that did the rounds around our schools when I was growing up and they were always really scary. And of course you look back now and think that's really not that scary, is it? But at the time you're terrified. 
I personally, I nearly entered folklore, the competition. I did in the end, but it was going to be with a ghost story. Um, but then I thought it was leaning too much into the supernatural rather than folklore. So I wasn't quite sure. Um, for us, there's a local wedding venue, it is now a wedding venue called the Lost Village of Dode. And it was completely abandoned during the Black Plague and set that empty for hundreds of years. Like no one's been in there since until recently. And yeah, there was gonna be a story about a little ghost that warned people of disease and illness and bad luck. Um, but that was making up my own folklore. So I didn't think it was quite true enough to enter, but yeah, that's how I was gonna go down ghost stories. Let's hope it's the next one. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I, in my home, when I was a child, the, the windows were like sliding windows. And when it became very, very windy, like the wind would blow through and it would make like a ghostly sound and the <laughs> curtains would like literally shake like that. And I would hide under the covers because of course, if you can't see it, it can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> Logic. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, there was with Thai Thai people basically if you go to Thailand like everyone there believes in ghosts and so it used to scare me a lot and my parents used to be very much like no like this is silly you shouldn't watch scary things you shouldn't listen to scary stories because it's just filling your brain with rot and of course like as a kid you want the thing that you're not allowed to do so whenever there was like a horror like you know soap opera on I would like watch it and then obviously scare myself <laughs> And then, you know, with enough time, they convinced me that ghosts didn't exist. And now as an adult, my mom is like, so I couldn't sleep last night because of ghosts. And I was like, wait, are you telling me this entire time you actually believed in ghosts and you were telling me <laughs> that, like not to listen to these stories or not to watch this stuff. I think my dad's still firmly in the like, it's nonsense camp, but like my mom's the type, the one who's Thai. So just, she kind of hid it all my childhood and now he's like, yeah, I believe in ghosts. <laughs> um, I have a question for the group, I guess. Um, was there a particular character in your story that you found yourself identifying with in some way? Or like, who'd you identify with the strongest? Probably the Modi do. <laughs> getting annoyed with everybody for being drunk and rowdy <laughs> keep it quiet Go home. and wear a face mask <laughs> I guess the the main character of mine the, um, not because I actually think she's that similar to me but because she's the point of view character mm. her voice was the one that came first so even though I don't think she is like me, I've had, you You do have to kind of add some bits of yourself into a character like that, so. I was really closely connected to the uh, Captain Ray at the end of my story. Um, I know it was a very small part, but I really, really liked that character and I really hope I can expand on her sometime. But for some reason, when she came on, like, it was like, I that's that was the character I really liked writing about. <laughs> I think we established the other night, we all loved Captain Ray. We're like, wow. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Plot twist. Yes. Uh, I would have to say Dr. Jamari, um, just because he's the nice character. I think he's the good yeah. person. And I, I think my characters are so, they're not all friendly. Um, I, I think, yeah, all professional, or well behaved. So yeah, Jamari's the kind of, rational thinker amongst them he's just kind and relaxed and chilled and mm. wants everyone to be okay so i think that kind of captures a part of me um but there are little parts of me in all my characters you try and try to not let yourself sink through but i think at times you just can't help it you know yeah. you from experience so they end up in there um but jamar is the closest definitely i think to what you said heather that I feel like that's the only way to make characters real is like even if they're not you is to add something of you in them but what's really strange is how other people read it so 
the the main character has this contentious relationship with her father and I don't by the way <laughs> <laughs> but everyone was like so I was reading it and I was wondering about your father and I was like not about oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Are you like, no, my, my, my father isn't a murderer and he doesn't have a, a hundred wives. <laughs> yeah, like my dad is, is a really nice guy who's like, I think, you know, I mean, as far as I'm aware, at least only ever been <laughs> with my mom in the last 30 years. So, <laughs> um, I guess I have a question. Um, like, is there any particular author you would like to hear, like at a convention or at some sort of workshop that, is there any author that, you know, popular or even deceased or something that you would like to like get some knowledge out of? <laughs> Tolkien, definitely Tolkien. If he was still around, he's my all time favorite. Definitely. I, I, he was amazing, really. So intelligent, you know, the, the languages he knew and his world building was just, phenomenal um yeah unfortunately that will never happen but if dreams could come true <laughs> yeah i mean i so i grew up um i really loving the the three musketeers and alexandre dumas um and i learned i mean i learned in high school that actually he's a he's a quarter black so he's descended from from kind of, uh, I think, Haitian um, slaves, and his father was a general, and so he was a, a like a, a man of color in France at this time, and if you think of France, oh. and I think it's, you know, he he built his his career at a time when it wasn't that normal to do so, and his his literature is considered like very, very, you know, symbolic of, of French culture, basically, right? Like, mm -hmm. you think of France, it's like, oh, you know, our great literature, the, the Three Musketeers, the Count of Monte Cristo, these great adventure novels. And, and I was wondering, like, what must that have been like for him? Um, so I would have loved to, to kind of, I, I mean, you know, he's dead, so that's never <laughs> happening. But I would have loved to have met him. And, and he just seemed like a fun guy. Like, all his books are obviously like swashbuckling romances, <laughs> apart from The Count of Monte Cristo, which is quite like an intense revenge novel. But he you could see that he had a kind of like passion for life and he must have been a fun guy to be, be around as well. So I'd have loved to pick his brains. <laughs> for me, Adrian Barnes, hand down. He, he wrote Nod as my favorite dystopian of all time. It's not hugely well known Nod, but it, it's, it's crazily beautiful. Um, again, no longer with us. I think this might be a seance rather than a... <laughs> <laughs> um, he actually wrote Nod whilst living with a brain cancer without knowing he had a tumour. Um, but to write something so hopeful and so... that is, It's just the way it is very light in a very dark situation in his book. And you can see that in the way he writes. And it's just... I want to know how he achieved that without just writing something that the world's ending. There's so much beauty in the hope that he writes. I'd love to see or know that a bit more. So yeah, that's him for me. I once went to a, a really interesting talk with um, Anthony Horowitz. It was at a oh. children's literature festival. And I was, um, uh, I think about 15 and um, I can't remember if it was me that asked the question, but someone asked the question, uh, what advice do you have for young writers? And he said, publishers are idiots. <laughs> he said, look how many people turned down J.K. Rowling. Mm -hmm. I love Anthony Horowitz's books. Yeah, yeah, the Diamond Brothers books are great. I wrote, he wrote yeah. Alex Ryder. Yeah. And then... Um there were other series that he wrote. I remember just reading like all of them. Mm, the the Diamond Brothers is a really good series. It's um, uh, this series of mystery novels. I think it's one of his earlier series as a children's writer. I think he only really became, I think he was mostly a TV writer until Alex Ryder became a really big book. And um, uh, yeah, it's about this um, 
uh, this uh, 13 year old boy who has a, a, an adult o- older brother who's a detective, but his brother is like a complete idiot and really incompetent. <laughs> so he has to like solve the mysteries for him. And he always like ends up in like these really sticky situations. <laughs> it's a really good series. It's really funny. I used to love that. I really liked his Power of Five series as well. I think it was like not quite as well known as his other ones, but it was mm. really good. I think I remember him saying that like he originally like he originally published them like decades earlier and then he like rewrote them and republished them. Oh really? <laughs> Yes, yeah, it's, it's, well, I can't remember if he'd, he'd just written them years earlier or if he'd actually written them and published them. But I think he did pu- have them published. Actually, on that note, what do you guys remember? What was like the the books that got you into reading? <laughs> Artemis Fowl. Uh, oh, Artemis Fowl. Oh my yeah. goodness. Oh, good. Love those. So I watched them recently and it was really bad. <laughs> 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 it was really upsetting. <laughs> I saw they did an Alex Ryder like TV series, and I'm also a bit like I'm not sure whether I want. I think to that's see. meant to be pretty good, actually. I'll I haven't have watched it yet, but not what I've heard. I um, think it's probably a, a a better thing, um like a better format for it. Mm. Actually, I mean, it's it wouldn't really apply to Alex Ryder, but I think that speculative fiction, like fantasy and sci-fi actually works better in a TV format. Yeah. Like with, I mean, it's probably easiest to see it with stuff like, um, stuff where the same intellectual property has been adapted, like um, uh, uh, the Clone Wars TV series and um, the the new Dark Crystal TV series and, uh, I haven't seen the, the the original film, but I just started watching the Snowpiercer series on Netflix. That's really good. I've heard that's really good. No, I mean, yeah. I definitely think if you're adapting a book, TV is definitely, a, like a series over the long run is a better idea than a book yeah. than a movie usually. <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited about the Lord of the Rings series that Amazon are going to be doing eventually. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm glad they're not just retelling the Lord of the Rings story. It's it's going to be like everything that happened before the Lord of the Rings. So I think that'll be really exciting to watch. Mm. I think um, Heather's book Murder the March Hare will definitely be uh, would work much better as a TV series in the movie because it definitely has that ensemble feel. I mean, I mean ensemble movies do exist, but. Um... Yeah, you, you wouldn't want a situation like the the ed, the uh, literary agent situation. It's like, okay, but who do they end up with? <laughs> <laughs> and when do the vampires come in? <laughs> the sparkly vampires, you mean? The sparkly vampires. Indeed. <laughs> Gosh. It's crazy to think that that's almost like 10 years ago. Oh and now it's like, oh, yeah. this is Twilight Revival. I'm like, God, I, I, I feel like that was yesterday. <laughs> yeah. I kind of feel like I have to read the new one to see if it's just like the other ones. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of the, the storyline, but it, it'd be interesting to see if her writings evolved in that big break to see if she gives a bit more female voice, maybe. Mm. I don't know. I'm nosy, so probably will. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, going back to your question about what got you into, was it reading or...? Yeah. Yeah, um, it was Nancy Drew for me. Like that was like, mom had some old Nancy Drew books and then I got back into like a new series that they were being um, published in the 90s, I think. And of course, by then, like, at that age, I didn't realize that it was a production and not a Carolyn Keene didn't exist. <laughs> but again, those books were really like my diving in. I was reading Nancy Drew and I was probably around 11, 12 years old sort of thing, so. It was definitely my jumping off point into other things. I mean, for me, it was Babysitter's Club and it's the same thing, right? Like Anna Martin, if she, I think she does actually exist, but like, she does not write all of those books. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, I remember as a kid, there was the, um, uh, do, do I remember like the fairies books that were like, there were like a hundred different books about, um, uh about different varieties of fairies and they were, oh, they all yeah. had like the same author name but they're actually written by about 40 different people 
I remember those. Like they had lovely illustrations, confused. didn't they? Yeah. It was like they they'd have like a series of like now it's it's the color fairies now it's it's the the, the crystal fairies now it's the Olympics fairies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the first like series I remember being really into was the famous five books. Yes. Oh uh, yeah. As well. Especially as I went to Corfu lot as the kid, which is um, what the castle on the island is based on, and actually near. Uh, like opposite the castle, there is a Enid Blyton shop. <laughs> which I, remember, I remember loving as a kid, but I, I, it's ridiculous. I stopped reading it because I was like, "You're so, they're, they're books. So you're supposed to, and it's a series. You're supposed to read them in order." So like, as soon as I got to like book six or whatever it was, I just stopped reading them because I didn't have the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty old school in the sense it was the Chronicles of Narnia. Oh, um, I love that. Mm, that yes, yes. They were good. Um, I even remember, like, I have the DVD copy of the old TV series. <laughs> yes, Sorry, I, oh, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. But, um, yeah, Chronicles of Narnia, definitely. when I was younger, um, when I started picking my own books, I, one of the most memorable ones is Northern Lights, Philip Pullman. Mm. That was one of the first ones I picked off the shelf myself. Like, um, it wasn't a gift. I had money and I could buy my own books. <laughs> um, yeah, that was a big one for me. Yeah, I, I, I can't, I just remember books always being a huge part of my life from a, a really young age. So I remember there were things like uh, Just So Tales and uh, folk of the faraway tree and Millie Molly Mandy and I think a lot of them were actually hand-me-downs from my older sister mm -hmm. um, so they've been around for a while and I think some of them were long before my time um, but yeah I think like I said earlier in the week the, the book that really changed it for me was when I first read The Hobbit when I was nine and that was like the most grown-up amazing thing I'd ever read and that was that was what got me into fantasy and and into all of that kind of stuff really. That for me, I think was The Giver, um, reading that book. I can't remember when I read that book, but I was pretty young and it just absolutely blew my mind. And the the other books that followed them as they came out, I read those and loved them too. But I think that was kind of my similar experience to you, Katie. I was like, wow, this is just like nothing. <laughs> I've never uh, seen this before. And it kind of pulled me into that speculative kind of fantasy world. I do think Harry Potter was my first proper introduction to, I mean, I was, I was young. I was like nine. I think my, I remember my, my year five teacher was reading out, out to us. And then it was frustrating because she'd only read, read a chapter at a time. So I was like, I need to know the rest of it. I'm going to buy, like, I'm going to get my own copy and read it now. <laughs> I loved the Harry Potter books. I remember not being far off Harry's age, so I kind of grew with him. So that was really cool. And I think I've read them probably more times than I'm willing to admit, really. But it was it was good when my daughter got old enough to be interested because then I got to read them again. So <laughs> I remember waiting in line for like when they the next ones would get released and it was a whole event. Yeah. 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 I remember it being a competition, especially with the like the the later ones when they were so big. Like, who could yeah. read it the fastest? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just remember when the last one came out, the bookshop we bought it from. They were all dressed as Harry Potter characters, and then my dad left his card in the shop, and Snape came running out after us. <laughs> like, you forgot your card. <laughs> oh, do you remember the Pot Potter Puppet Pals? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Snape. That's who I've imagined running out with your father's card. <laughs> oh. It's funny. Considering Anushka's about to probably announce the new competition. And considering you all happen to be competition winners, have you got any tips for anyone attempting to write short stories? Because I suck at them and it'd be really great to get some tips off you guys. I think you just need to try and 
like like I said about flash fiction the other night, try and make every word count. There's not really much room for waffle in short stories. Um, yeah. Yeah, if it's not essential, don't keep it. <laughs> yeah. It's very good uh, editing because my, my story was always intended to be a novel. I'd already started writing it as a novel and I feel like I'm very critical of it when I read it now. I'm, I don't know if anyone else does this when you give your writing to someone else and you're like, so this is my writing, by the way, I know all these things are wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> so the one in mine is where it's originally intended to be a novel and the beginning is very like in depth and long. And then halfway through, I'm like, oh crap, it's 8,000 words I need for this submission. Um, so I need to wrap it up and it jumps times like years very quickly. And then even then it was a bit too long. So then it was like ruthlessly editing, but I do actually think it it's kind of better writing when it's tightly edited. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just adapt stories so then it can be longer or shorter just depending on how much detail you want to fill in. I think the main thing is you just gotta know Hello. Come back. <laughs> the worst possible time. <laughs> I've, I've got a question. Um, is there a uh, like a historical Ooh, figure or a pressure, celeb celebrity Sorry. that you'd really like to um, uh, like a like um write about like their their life in some way either like um like a, a highly fictionalized version or something like that like a his historical figure or a celebrity or something I mean I guess I mentioned Alexandre Dumas earlier because that was the the shiny other idea that almost distracted me from this novel mm -hmm. was I didn't realize but actually he you know all of his writing or again it's it's considered very French very t like epitome of like French literary culture. Mm. Um, he actually wrote a book called Georges featuring a, a mixed race character. And this was a lot of people Ooh. think the precursor to Count of Monte Cristo because it's a revenge story and it's it follows a very similar path, but it actually takes place on this island with a slave uprising and, and the mixed race character. He's part of the kind of all of that movement. And I was just, and obviously no one knows about that book, right? So like, I was like, I wonder, again, what it must have been like being in that society at that time, being who he was, writing these novels that are so popular, that people love so much, and then himself probably facing quite a lot of discrimination at the same time. And, yeah. and I was wondering if like all that rage was channeled into this one book that never really, not that it never saw the light of day, it did get published, but just didn't get the acclaim that the other books did. So that was something I was like, that would be a great story. And I was looking and no one seems to have written a biography about him. I'm not gonna write a biography about him. I think that's that's too hard, but I was like, that's a great idea for, for a historical fiction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually am in the process of trying to set up a podcast that goes into the paranormal stories and everything. And I stumbled upon uh, a mystery outside of um, where I live and it's called the Baldoon mystery which is like a poltergeist oh. uh, story that was actually reported in newspapers at the time and it was like heavily um, it was heavily reported heavily discussed back in like the late 1800s I think and it's like I think I would love to try to go back and do more research on it and see if there I could come up with another storyline to it or even just to try to re reword it into a more of a fictional historical storyline towards it <laughs> i think I'd, I'd love to document david attenborough's life oh, i love david yeah. attenborough i think he's lived an incredible life he must have so that would be you know to be able to just sit down and discuss that with him in itself would be an absolute honor wouldn't it so yeah that'd be cool Okay, so does anyone else have any questions? No, I think we're yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, this, it's been like the same amount of time as the other ones. So, oh, yeah, I guess this, this is probably a, 
a good place to wrap up. Um, uh, thank you all very much for joining us tonight um, and congratulations on, on these two fantastic books. You know, you've, you've all done a really good job. Um, uh, for those of you at home, uh, if you're still with us at the end of this live stream, congratulations. <laughs> now I will announce the topic of the next short story competition. Uh, in the last two live streams, we had giveaways of audiobooks of both Deities by Stuart Clark and Lost Words by Kevin Peake. So if you're starting to do your normal commute again and you want an audiobook to listen to on the way to work, check out the last two live streams to find out how to win. So without further ado, the topic of the next Crystal Peak short story competition is, drum roll please. Steampunk. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> so if you head over to uh, the Crystal Peak website at 10 o'clock, uh, there'll be all the information you need concerning entering the competition. Uh, we're also proud to announce that uh, one of the judges uh, uh, for this competition is veteran children's author Colin R. Parsons. He's publishing his YA science fiction novel, The Gamer, with us and has a lot of experience writing within the steampunk genre. He has his own YouTube channel where he posts writing tips, uh, poems and short stories, as well as uh, he's also recorded several contributions to our Ask Our Author series. So if you want to find out more about him, I highly recommend subscribing to both uh, our channel and his channel. That's exciting. Um, uh, we also post our book trailers and wisdom from our authors every Friday. So if you enjoyed this video, you want to learn more about being a writer and you want to hear about our new releases, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell if you want to be notified whenever we post a video. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and I hope you'll keep up with us in the future to see more from our writers and our latest releases. Bye! Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.